The topic today is a great topic. It's visitors from other worlds. Are there other beings out there somewhere in space? We're going to talk today and try to answer some of the biggest questions, but we're going to talk about the mysteries of the universe. I have some terrific stuff for you. And uh, I loved presenting this material to a vast crowd of atheists and skeptics and unbelievers, as I've done in Russia and Ukraine and other places. We're going to try to answer, and I, I believe successfully, these questions. Did the universe have a beginning? What about the steady state theory that has been believed by virtually all of the scientists until relatively recently? You know what the steady state theory is? That was held by Einstein, and that was that the universe always was there. I want you to do this with your fingers. Can you do this with your fingers? Okay. I see some of you folks aren't doing it. Would you? <laughs> it's going to throw me off if you're not doing it. Okay, now I feel better. You're all doing it. Did you know that the remotest star in our universe helps to make it possible for you to do this? Hmm. Yeah, we're going to talk about that today. How big is the universe? Is this the only universe? And if you believe in God as I do, what is God like? And what prophecies predict the return of the king and visitors from beyond time and space? Let's get started, shall we? The universe is very, very big. We now know that the universe of large and medium-sized galaxies consists of 200 billion galaxies and each galaxy is composed of around 200 billion suns. In the Milky Way system, of which we are a tiny little part, but an important part, there are 200 billion suns. If you look at this picture here, here you have one of these vast galaxies, and there are how many? 200 billion of those in the universe. Our planet is just a tiny little dot in the universe, these amazing spots here, each of these is a galaxy. How did it happen? Where did it come from? Besides 200 billion medium and large galaxies with an average of 200 billion stars, there are 100 times more small galaxies all with billions and billions and billions of suns. The number of suns in the universe, I don't know if I can say this, but it's, it's a terrific figure. It's 40 with zero and... Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I can't say that number. I can't say that number. But that's the number of suns in the cosmos plus billions of dwarfed galaxies, plus billions of planets, plus comets and black holes, etc. Now, what I'm going to tell you now is a relatively recent discovery. This is almost too hard to believe. What we see in the universe is only 0.27% of the universe. And you say, well, that's possibly because we do not have... Uh, telescopes that are big enough. No, no, no. We have telescopes now that can peer back to the very beginning of time. The reason is this. Listen carefully. More than 99% of the universe is not visible to our eyes. It's even all around us. It's in this room. It's in the studio. More than 99% of the universe is composed of a material that scientists now call dark matter. This dark matter is composed of three different types of dark matter. There's ordinary dark matter, 
there's exotic dark matter and there is dark energy. And so when we look out and we see these vast galaxies, the billions and billions of great galaxies, we are only seeing about a quarter of 1% because the vast, the vast amount of the universe is composed of this mysterious stuff that is called uh, dark matter. Mm. Where did it all come from? The atheist says, Richard Dawkins says, the entire universe, he says, this vast universe, all of this, all of this, he says, and he says this with a straight face. He said this in a debate with the great Christian professor from Oxford University, Dr. John Lennox. He said, we believe it came from nothing. He said, we believe that nothing made nothing, which made Lennox say, you are a remarkable man of faith. <laughs> Would you please come in your Bible to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, my dear friends, and I'm so glad that you're here today in our studio in beautiful Moore Park in Southern California. These words are the most important words that have ever been uttered by a human being. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the Bible teaches there was a time when there was nothing. And then the Bible makes the extraordinary statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Let me talk for a moment about the Big Bang that most or some Christians who don't understand astronomy are afraid of. There's a remarkable picture of Professor Hubble. You've heard of Hubble, Hubble Telescope and Einstein and they're having a meeting. There you have the great Professor Einstein. Here is the great Professor Hubble and before this meeting, listen to this, Einstein, perhaps one of the greatest minds that the human race has ever produced, he believed in the steady state theory. Almost every scientist believed in the steady state theory. That is, the universe has always, always been there. Matter is virtually eternal. And then Professor Hubble showed to the great Professor Einstein the red shift, which you can see with your eyes. And it shows that the universe in which we live is exploding out at almost the speed of light. And it shows that if, if it is moving out like this, then it came from virtually something smaller than a proton with inconceivable energy. And scientists said, this must be, they, they, they were nonplussed, they were staggering for words. They said, we will call it the Big Bang. Virtu and it was, virtually all scientists now believe that the universe had a beginning. Now, some of my dear Christian friends have a problem with the concept of the Big Bang. But they don't realize that this discovery that was pointed out by Professor Hubble to Professor Einstein is one of the greatest proofs that this old book is absolutely true. Because it said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Do you know this? There was a time when there was no time. Mm -hmm. There was no matter and there was no space and all in a tiny microsecond uh, there came this tremendous explosion and uh, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Listen to this. Some have said to me, well, if you believe in this point of time, and if you can measure it as many, as all the great scientists do, then you've, you're forced to believe in evolution, my friend. Nothing is further than, than this idea from the truth. 
the truth of a beginning at a relatively, I say relatively, recent time is the greatest argument against evolution. Now, let me tell you why. Let us think of a single cell. Did you know that in your body you have trillions and trillions of cells? Did you know that each cell, each cell is more complex than the city of Los Angeles? The chance of a cell, this has been worked out by scientists mathematically, the chance that a cell could somehow spontaneously generate is 10 with 40,000 zeros after it. The total number of atoms in the universe is 10 with 80. I want to look you in the eye. I want to say to the audience, I want to say to you today, the chance, the idea that life can originate by itself spontaneously is far-fetched and ridiculous. 10 to 40,000. Whereas in the whole of the universe, you've only got that number of atoms. It is beyond reason. It is, it is a crazy idea. Remember the saying. I hope I got it right. If it walks like a duck, mm-hmm. if it looks like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, maybe, maybe, my friend, maybe it is a duck, you say. You see, hear what we're saying? Now listen to this. I want to talk to you now about something you're not going to hear probably in any other sort of meeting like this. I, I don't even expect you to believe it, but it is true. It is absolutely scientist, uh, uh, scientific. Every sci- uh, uh, A great astronomer explained this to me and I said to him, Do you believe, do you really believe this? He said, well, every educated person does. (laughs) All right. The fine-tuning of the universe. When the point of creation occurred, four forces of nature came into being. They had not existed before what scientists call the Big Bang. How many forces? Four. Let me tell you about them. Number one is gravity. Number two is electromagnetism. Number three, you can look this up in any scientific book. The strong nuclear force and the weak nuclear force. These forces had not existed before the point of creation that is described in Genesis 1 and verse 1. Have I lost you? Are you still with me? Listen to this. These Four forces, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, they did not exist before the moment that is called the Big Bang by scientists. They came into being in a microsecond after this tremendous explosion. Listen to this. If they had been out of sync, you know what I mean? If they had been out of balance, by one quadrillionth, that's one quadrillionth, of 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 one quadrillionth, there would have been no universe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the universe is has a fine tuning such as human beings on this planet cannot conceive or realize or replicate. Uh, Dawkins said, when he was talking to the great professor John Lennox, he says, it looks as though it were intelligently designed. Mm. He said, but uh, he said, it's not, it's not because there's no God. Uh, But he said, it looks as though it were. Now remember, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, then the odds are it is a duck, you know. Okay, that's the fine tuning of those four forces. The second one I call the old uh, gravity meter. 
When I was a boy growing up in Brisbane, Australia, uh, we were not very wealthy. It was my parents had come out of the Great Depression. Most young people never even heard of that. So we didn't have a lot of, you know, we didn't have televisions in those days. Nobody did. But we had radios. And we had a little radio that was called, it was the joy of our home. It was called a Peter Pan. And I used to listen to all the serials at nighttime. <laughs> the search for the golden boomerang. And <laughs> you folks never heard of this stuff. Where have you been? But it had a, a dial. You know what a radio dial is? Mm -hmm. You turn it and it's got uh, a line there and it's got all the stations, 4BC and all these stations in Brisbane. So I would dial in so I could listen to my serials when I should have been doing my homework. Now, what we're going to do now, we're going to have the gravity meter, the gravity dial. What I'm telling you is true. You may say, I just don't believe this stuff. What I'm telling you is scientifically true. I want you to think of a line and it's 100 billion miles that way, 100 billion miles this way. In fact, it's trillions of miles across. It's inconceivable to our little finite minds. And you have the capacity to tune in gravity. You can dial it in. Okay. Billion miles this way, billion miles this way. It's calibrated in inches. This controls the gravity of the universe. It's set on zero. If you go one inch to the left, the world blows up and the universe blows up. If you go one inch to the right, the universe explodes or implodes. Nothing left. We are sitting on a knife edge. That's why Dawkins, the world's greatest atheist, said, it looks as though it were intelligently designed. Mm -hmm. Remember the dark. Now, let me talk to you about dark matter. Now, number three in this fine tuning, I want to talk to you about dark matter. Dark energy that we cannot see, we know it is there because we can measure it. We can feel the force of the dark energy. There is dark energy all around us. We cannot see it. More than 99% of the universe, not made of stars or planets, things that we can see, it is made of this dark energy. The dark energy drives the expansion of the universe. The universe is exploding out like this. You say, well, I never heard this in church. Well, we don't talk about this stuff in church, do we? But the universe is expanding out like this. You can actually see it going out. If the universe goes too fast, uh, there'll be an unheard of catastrophe. But if it goes too slow, there'll be an unheard of catastrophe also. Now listen to this. Listen to this. The dark energy that drives the universe is fine-tuned to one part to 10 to 120. The number of atoms in the universe is 10 to 80. This means... that someone, a mighty mind, is behind it all. I could not be an atheist. I could not be an honest atheist and believe that these are the odds concerning the driving force behind the expansion of the universe. Look at that figure. Remember the duck, but remember something else. The chance of this happening by itself is like a man who's blind. He's deaf and he's wearing gloves. <laughs> this is true. 
This is the sand on one of our beaches. But I'm not talking about one of our beaches. I'm talking about the sand in all the world and the sand on the moon, and Mars, and the 200 billion galaxies. I'm talking about that vast, incomprehensible amount of sand. And somebody has taken one grain of sand and marked it. (laughs) One grain of sand and marked it, and you have, you're blind, you're wearing gloves, you stumble, and you're told, uh, go out and find the marked piece of sand. They are the same odds. So I want to say to the people watching the telecast, I don't believe in God because I was brought up to believe in God. I don't believe in God because I have just got faith. I don't have a lot of sympathy intellectually for a person who says, oh, I just have faith. I believe, well, you know, Dawkins has got faith too. He's got faith in these silly ideas. But what I want you to know is this, that there is overwhelming evidence why a thinking person can believe that there is a creator who made it all. Now, the Bible teaches, did you know this, that the universe had a beginning and the universe will have an ending. Oh, you say, no, the universe can't have an ending. Oh, I'm sorry, the Bible teaches the universe had a beginning and the universe is going to have an ending. I'm going to come in the Bible over here to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. I want you to take your Bible and come over here to 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. 2 Peter chapter 3 in the Bible and verse 10 says... But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Then if you come to verse 12, looking for and hasting the coming of the day of God because of which the heavens will be dissolved being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So if I'm reading my Bible with an open mind, it seems to me to teach that the whole universe is going to be replaced. And I'm going to tell you why it has to be. Every scientist in the world, Christian, atheist, Buddhist, Muslim, believes that we believe we live in an expanding universe, blasting out at almost the speed of light. The day will come when the galaxies and the suns and the moons and the stars will be so far apart that they will blink out. But before this happens, God is going to step in and create a new heaven and a new earth. You see, we think that God somehow is a part of our universe, of his 200 billion galaxies, plus the other ones. But God existed before and outside of our universe. God was not in time. The Bible says he made it, and so he was outside of it. Now, do this again. I'm going to tell you something. It's pretty hard to believe. I only just discovered this. I've been doing a lot of research on this for 20 years. What you're doing here is that you are overcoming inertia. Inertia is the tendency of an object to remain at rest and once it's moving to keep going in the same speed. If... If inertia was different, you couldn't do this. You perhaps would need muscles, huge muscles to do it. And once you started doing it, you couldn't stop your fingers. It would mean that you could go to a boulder. Say there's a huge boulder and you could puff on the boulder and it would just blow away. The world would be tremendously chaotic if we did not have this inertia worked out properly. 
I'm going to read you something. Physicists now propose that the inertia forces experienced by objects on Earth are generated by the total combined gravitational attraction of all matter in the cosmos, including the most distant stars and galaxies. You couldn't do this without the help of a galaxy which is a trillion miles away. And your hand was made to do it. Mm-hmm. This is a dime. I'm going to tell you about the dime and God. I'm going to take a break. But we'll be back. We're going to talk about the dime and God. Amazing, amazing discovery. Hello, friend. I'm John Carter in Russia. This is my 43rd visit to this land, and I come not for this weather, but to preach the gospel of Christ. The need here is tremendous. The first big campaign was in the year 1991 in the great city of Moscow, followed by a mighty campaign here in 1992 in Nizhny Novgorod, when in the Volga River, 2,530 souls were baptized into Jesus Christ. The need here has not lessened. The people are crying out for God. I'm asking you today, in the name of Jesus, please support us in the preaching of the gospel of Christ to the Russian people. Please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California 91358. In Australia, you can write to me at the address now appearing on the screen at Terrigal. I'm here, my friend, to bring Christ to the Russian people. Already we have seen the mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God we have seen hundreds of thousands of people come to Christ in Russia. Please write to me, John Carter, Post Office Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358 in Australia. Write to me at Terrigal. In the name of God, please support this work. For a copy of today's program, please contact us at P.O. Box 1900, Thousand Oaks, California, 91358. Or in Australia, contact us at P.O. Box 861, Terrigal, New South Wales, 2260. This program is made possible through the generous support of viewers like you. We thank you for your continued support. May God richly bless you.